In 1957, the Soviet Union launched the world's first artificial satellite, Sputnik 1. The United States responded by launching a satellite of its own, Explorer 1. It was the official start of the space race, and soon after, the United States would go on to create NASA. But what if the United States reacted differently? What if, instead of feeling the pressure to advance its technology in higher education, the U.S. chose to file a lawsuit and take the Soviet Union to international court instead? This was the first time in world history that technology this advanced was successfully launched into outer space. And with Sputnik flying high above everyone's heads, humanity was heading into uncharted waters. But luckily for us, when asked to meet the Soviets' challenge, US leadership didn't turn to their lawyers. They turned to their scientists. The resulting space race pushed the Soviet Union and the United States to pursue space at full speed. And along the way, both world powers would rack up some huge accomplishments. The Soviets got the first human into space, and the US was the first to land a human on the moon. The first don't stop there. The first spacewalk, the first interstellar probe, the list goes on and on and on. If the United States had gone before the International Court of Justice and argued that the Soviet Union had violated US airspace, maybe they would have won. But if they did, the world we live in would look very different. And then instead of having things like GPS, right. weather satellites, global telecommunication, digital photography, wireless headphones, advanced water purification, and freeze-dried ice cream, we would live in a world where every nation's territory extends infinitely upward, with nearly any country being able to legally block any other nation from orbiting the Earth. Instead, the Eisenhower administration was actually very happy that Russia had set the legal precedent. It was official. Space was open to all nations. All nations that had the scientists, money, and technology, that is. We take it as a given that the free market is more efficient than the government. And it is. A business has to be efficient in order to survive. But efficient at doing what, exactly? From the market standpoint, the only thing that matters is return on investment. If that means making things that people buy, fine. If that means that suing your competitors to stop them from making things that people buy, well, that's fine too. Whatever makes the stock price go up. That explains why smartphone companies have been fighting these epic legal battles over patents. So many familiar smartphone features, pinch to zoom, slide to unlock, and links and text messages have all been subjects of multi-million dollar lawsuits. Back in 2012, a Stanford law professor estimated that smartphone companies had spent up to $20 billion in the previous few years buying patents to use in litigation, and that another billion dollars went to lawyers. That's close to NASA's budget last year. This isn't new. Even Alexander Graham Bell got caught up in a patent war. For over 140 years, there's been debate on whether it was Graham Bell or rival Alicia Gray who deserves credit for inventing the telephone. Their attorneys submitted paperwork for their client's very similar talking telegraph, or telephone, to the U.S. Patent Office on the same day. The U.S. Patent Office ruled that Bell's application arrived first, and the telephone patent, one of the most valuable patents in history, was issued to Bell on March 7th. Correspondence, notes from an associate, and other key documents would eventually clear Bell's name, but not before the rumor spread far and wide. Research suggests that patent litigation actually stifles innovation and hurts high-tech industries. Patent trolls are notorious for stifling innovation. Often using overly broad technology patents based on dated technology, trolls threaten litigation and bring infringement suits against inventors. Trolls typically do not produce actual products or services, but are in the business of litigation. Just like a camper in a video game, they lie in wait for someone to create a process or a product that has some relationship to the patent they hold. Then they pounce, with threats and lawsuits. Patent litigation is infamously risky, time-consuming, and expensive. 
three things that any forward-thinking tech company on the bleeding edge of technology tends to avoid for its own survival. Plus, the subjects of most modern patent cases are notoriously complex. Having to explain their complicated technology to judge and jury can be a daunting task. The outcome is inherently unpredictable. Defendants risk a lot by fighting a case through trial. The problem is that going into space requires huge startup costs and takes many years. Many investors aren't interested in funding an enterprise that won't see returns for decades. Going into space also requires cooperation. No one business can do it alone. So when each business tries to put its own interests above everything else, it doesn't always lead to healthy competition. Sometimes it leads to all kinds of gridlock, waste, and red tape. You know, the things the free market isn't supposed to have. That's what we saw last year in a battle over a NASA contract for a private company to land astronauts on the moon. Three companies, Elon Musk's SpaceX, Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin, and a defense contractor in Alabama called Dynetics were competing for the contract. NASA announced that it was planning on awarding contracts to two companies. But then Congress didn't allocate as much money to the program as NASA had expected. So then, last April, NASA awarded the contract to only one company, SpaceX, for $2.9 billion. Blue Origin and Dynetics filed a protest with the Government Accountability Office. And SpaceX had to wait 95 days before starting its contract. Then, last August, Blue Origin sued NASA and SpaceX over the contract, further delaying SpaceX's work. At one point in September, the Department of Justice had to postpone a deadline by another week because it was having difficulty dealing with the 16 gigabytes worth of case documents. That's the equivalent of 16,000 copies of Moby Dick. One of the reasons for the delay was that the lawyers were having trouble applying page numbers to all the documents. In other words, NASA's plan to return to the moon using private spaceflight companies is getting bogged down in paperwork. This cuts both ways. SpaceX has sued Blue Origin and the US government over the government's procurement process in the past. Back in 2019, SpaceX made the claim that the Air Force gave an unfair advantage to its competitors, Blue Origin, Northrop Grumman, and United Launch Alliance, by awarding them launch service agreements and excluding SpaceX. Launch service agreements are worth hundreds of millions of dollars. They were developed by the Air Force to give recipients a helping hand in developing massive new rockets that could one day be capable of launching national security payloads for the military. United Launch Alliance was promised around $967 million for its Vulcan Centaur rocket. Northrop Grumman was awarded up to $792 million for the development of their Omega launch vehicle. Blue Origin will get $500 million for its new Glenn rocket. The awards, however, do not guarantee that the new rockets will one day win extremely lucrative military launch contracts. Of the companies that received launch service agreements, only United Launch Alliance was selected to move on to Phase 2 of the procurement process. SpaceX was also selected for Phase 2. United Launch Alliance will get 60% of national security launches over five years, and SpaceX the remaining 40. Even though SpaceX was selected for Phase 2, their complaint was that they experienced hardship paying for their rocket development on their own. SpaceX asked the court to rule the launch service agreement awards invalid and forced the Air Force to end their $967 million six-year agreement with United Launch Alliance. The Air Force made it clear in its response to the lawsuit that getting rid of United Launch Alliance's launch service agreement could delay the readiness of the company's Vulcan Centaur rocket to perform in phase two. The biggest reason for all these lawsuits is that a lot of space activity just isn't that profitable yet. Oh, the potential is definitely there. There are probably quadrillions of dollars worth of valuable minerals in our solar system. There's just no infrastructure to exploit these resources. And no private company would want to build the infrastructure if they can't be guaranteed a profit. Something similar happened in the 1930s. Private utility companies had wired cities for electricity, but they saw no profit in connecting homes in rural areas to the grid. It took an act of Congress, the Rural Electrification Act of 1936, 
to provide loans for electric co-ops before the rest of America got power. And today, we're seeing something very similar with access to high-speed internet. Today, about 42 million Americans, and a quarter of all people in rural areas, lack access to broadband. Getting these people connected would boost the U.S. economy, but the benefits would probably go to companies like Facebook and Netflix, and probably not to Comcast or Verizon or whoever actually lays the cable. That's part of what drove the debate over net neutrality. Internet service providers want to capture some of the profit generated by high-speed internet by selling fast lane access to companies that deliver content. Let's compare that with South Korea, which has the world's fastest internet and universal fiber access. The Korean government invested heavily in fiber infrastructure, and it allows every telecom to access it at reasonable rates so they can compete against one another on the same platform. That's why the internet in Korea is much faster and much cheaper than in the United States. In other words, competition between businesses can be great for innovation, but only if it's constrained. The ground rules have to direct each business's energies towards producing something other than legal documents. Getting into space is hard enough. If we create incentives for space flight companies to compete in the courtroom, we could end up creating even more barriers to future innovation. Whether it's suing for consideration in government contracts, to stall the competition, or to protect intellectual property, the lucrative paydays of space exploration are too good to pass up on. Important legal principles may be established that shape the future, but in the short term, important new science and innovation could end up tied up in court. While we're facing big problems, climate change, asteroid defense, space debris, there's a clear need for innovation on a planetary scale. But what kind of future are we heading towards if crucial scientific efforts are being held back by politics, huge financial incentives, and bloodthirsty lawyers? For more videos like this, subscribe to this channel right now and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any great content. Also, look out for a curiosity stream on social media. Links in the description.